God bless you in Jesus' name. I want you to quickly turn to your neighbor and say to them, it is better to be raised than to just grow up. Turn to your other neighbor and say, it is better to be raised than to just grow up. Look for someone far from you. Point to them and say, it is better to be raised than to just grow up. Hallelujah. Father Lord, I yield myself to you this afternoon. And I ask that your name be glorified. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is yea and amen. Thank you because the world suffers no loss. Lord, we give you all the glory. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Well done, everyone who's contributing to making our services what they are gradually becoming. May the Lord be committed to you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We've been in this series, Thy Kingdom Come. And this is, I believe, installment number 13. And last week, we started to look at a people under God. We looked at when individuals are under, under God and they administer their lives by the word of God. And we looked at when families are under God and they ma administer their lives by the word of God. We did learn, we saw that the Bible contains commands, principles, and encouragement that if we follow, we are guaranteed success and progress individually as families. We agreed that every doctor, every lawyer, every president, every thief, every terrorist, and so on was raised within a family and were first either good or bad people. Before good or bad human beings before they became bad governors and bad presidents and bad bosses and bad teachers and bad doctors. So fundamentally, if you want a healthy and a thriving society, you must begin from the individual. Hallelujah. And that suggests that it is a place of personal responsibility that I must be responsible and everyone in this room and under the sound of my voice must be responsible if we want our society to be what it should be. Now, I am yet to see a situation where a man is a good individual or a good human being and he raises demons as children. Because the Bible says that if you, raise, that if you train up a child in the way that he would go, that when he grows up, he would not depart from it. That's not to say that as children or that we, as we have become adults, that we didn't miss our way at some point or the other. But because of the seed that has been sown in us, that was waiting for the day of harvest, in the day of harvest, we found our way back. We course corrected and we found our ways back to the path that our parents had, had raised, us, raised us in. Hallelujah. We concluded that our society simply reflects who we are as families. So if you say Nigeria is corrupt, hello, your family is corrupt. That's what it means. If you say Nigeria is a bunch of thieves, it's not the landmass that is Nigeria. It's you and me that makes Nigeria. So if Nigeria is a bunch of thieves, by your estimation, there is a thief in your house. Because our society is a reflection of our families. Hallelujah. Today, we want to quickly move on and we want to look at a church under God. But before we get into a church under God, there was something I did not say last week when I was talking about raising families under, you know, uh, who, that are raising families that are administered by the word of God. What I did not tell you is that the family is so important in the scheme of things that the devil has gone on a spree to, um, what's the word, redefine what a family is. And we think that's just for their selfish gain. No, it is an end time ploy to ensure that when the family doesn't look like what the family is supposed to look like, pay attention to me, then the family will
would be unable to produce what families produce. They, so, I mean, one day we woke up and one odd sitcom here and there started to have two dads and two moms. And some of us would chuckle and be like, these people are crazy. Then it got to a point that no um, series will succeed in Hollywood. Even in South Africa right now, if it does not have a, um, a gay element, whether it's a couple, whether it's a child coming out, something. And we still chuckled and we laughed. What we did not recognize is that the devil is redefining the family. So that once the family doesn't look like what God says it could look like, that family cannot raise what God says we should raise. And we think it doesn't matter. But really, that's not what I came to talk about today. I'm just highlighting it again to help you see that unless you stand upon your watch as a person and you do the work in your households, <laughs> You see this thing that we're laughing and we're chuckling and we're saying they are crazy. It will soon knock on our doors if we're not careful. That's if it's not knocking on our doors already. Hallelujah. The point that I'm making is the family is the pillar of society. Yesterday, I was, um, I had, uh, it was my mentoring Saturday, so I had one mentoring session after another mentoring session. And in one of our sessions, one of my mentees, who just got promoted in a school somewhere abroad. And she actually asked to be made a school counselor because she wanted to be able to hover over children and pray over them. Started to share about some child who is self-harming. What that means is the child will just wake up and begin to cut itself, herself, you know, and, you know, and self-harming and suicidal. And she said, when she, this child came to her and they started to have conversations, this child says, well, that, um, um, that her parents are divorced and they have remarried. So now she's confused. She doesn't know where she belongs. And wait for it. The parents that got divorced were two moms. They, were, they, re, they, they adopted her when she was to raise her to this point. Now they are divorced. They've not gone off to marry two different people. So this child has four moms. The spirit of error is how the enemy is taking the family apart. But what do I know? Now, last week, I did say in passing as I was closing that whatever the family is not able to impute into a person, we better pray that the church will be able to impute into the person before the person hits the streets. So, obviously, there are certain things that families are not equipped to be able to release into the lives of, of their of their family members. You know, not every family is rounded like that. But the Bible says the church is a great house. Pay attention to me. That the church is a great house and in it you find vessels of all kinds. And what that means is that whatever family lacks, church family should put it together. So that in the end, we will raise grounded, solid, good human beings. Automatically, what that means is that the church should not be so concerned about filling the pews as they should be concerned about what they are releasing into the street on Monday morning. What's the point of a 5 million member church if 4.9 million of them are demons? What's the point of filling the pews if we cannot release into society? Pay attention to me. If we cannot release into society good human beings who can influence and change the narrative. If you have ever thought about it before, you've ever heard it taught. 
you'll be told that the church exists for three things. And that's where I'm going to start. It's where I should end, but that's where I want to start. The church exists for three things. Number one, for the exaltation of God. What that means is that the church exists so that all may know that Jesus is Lord. The church exists for the exaltation of God. If you look at um, Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 12. Let's put that on the screen quickly. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 12. Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 12. Mm. Please give me a moment to get to it. Ephesians 1 verse 12. It says that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his what? His glory. If you read it in the message translation, it says, let me read from verse 11. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eyes on us, had designs on us for glorious living. Part of the overall purpose, he is working out in everything and everyone, simply to put him on display. Number two reason why the church exists is for the edification of the saints. For the edification of the saints. What does the word edify? To build for the building of the saints. So when the church exists. So that even if someone walked in here today weak. Somehow when they are living they are stronger. For the edification. For the building of the saints. You can see Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. And Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 13 or 15. The third reason why the church exists. Is the evangelization of the word. The evangelization of the word. If you look at Mark chapter 16 verse 15. And you look at Matthew chapter 18, 19 to 20. You see that Jesus at the tail end of his life in the flesh said. I send you go ye therefore. And do what? And do what? Make disciples. So the church exists, number one, for the glorification of God. Number two, for the edification of the saints. And number three, for the evangelization of the word. A church under God. Just think about that title. It doesn't make sense. It does not make sense. A church under God. Under who should the church be? But we have come to the point where we actually have to identify us, you know, our own house as a church under God. Because there are churches that we don't know what they are under. But I'm not here to criticize the church. And this is by no means is me criticizing the church. This is me sensitizing my brothers and sisters in this house that we are a church under God. Hallelujah. A church under God. If you look at the Bible carefully, you will see in the Old Testament that nations relied on prophets and priests to determine their health. Nations relied on Prophets and priests to determine their wealth. Nations depended on prophets and priests to determine their safety. Their sick, anything that is good. The, the nation or the king had to have a designate priest or prophet whose instructions the nation will follow. It's the way God set it up. And when we started this thing, I told us that unless we return to original intent, the boss bass bass is going to have to continue. 
Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I want to be able to learn this. I'm only doing a church under God today. I will not even dare to do a nation under God. Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. I want us to look at verse 5 and 6. Deuteronomy 4 verse 5 and 6. I'm going to be reading first out of the New King James translation. And then I'll read out of the message translation. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments. Just as the Lord my God commanded me. That you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Let me read it to you in the message translation. It says, Pay attention. I am teaching you the rules and regulations that God commanded me so that you may live by them in the land that you are entering to take up ownership. Keep them. Practice them. You will become wise and understanding. When people hear and see what's going on, they will say, what a great nation. So wise. So understanding. We have never seen anything like it if you read it in verse 7 and 8 it even makes it <laughs> let's read verse 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy chapter number 4 it says for that great nation I'll read it in the King James in New King James and I'll read it in the message it says for what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgment as I in all this law which I set before you today. If you read it in the message translation, here is how it says it. Verse 7 and 8. It says, yes, what other great nation has gods that are intimate with them the way God, our God, is with us? Always ready to listen to us. And what other great nation has rules and regulations as good and fair as this revelation that I'm setting before you today? The church is the preserver of the standards of God in society. The role of the church is to preserve. Please pay attention to me. Oh. The real role of the church is to take the learning from the word of God and use build strategies, templates with it, so that society, nations, continents are preserved. The church as ordained by God, is to be the protector and the store of divine truth. What should happen is when the president is not sure what to do, he should ask, who are the elders of faith? He should go send them to, for them to come. And when they come, they should have answers that change the dynamics of the game. That's how God set it up. Whether it's happening like that or not, it's not God's fault. If it's not happening, then those, you and me that call ourselves church, we're probably ignorant of our role, or we're not playing it properly. When the church is as the church should be in, Every Fortune 500 company, every Fortune 100, every Fortune 50, every organization that wants to stand must have on its board one prophet of God. If we were doing our work properly, 
When they set up boards, they don't have to be believers, but they will have to look for a believer on the board because believers, according to the way God ordained it, are the recipitary of God's wisdom. Now, what do we hear? People would rather do business with anybody but a believer. The church must be failing or we must be ignorant. I choose that we are ignorant, which means that there is hope. Hallelujah. Moses said to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 4, he said, apply God's truth and commands to your lives in such a way that other nations would see you and want what you have. Remember that when they stepped into the promised land, they were surrounded by seven heathen nations. Hevites, Hittites, Gigashites, those tites, all of them. They surrounded them. Because it was their land that God gave to Israel. So even if they moved, they wouldn't move that far away. The idea was Israel would be in the center of them. And Israel's light will shine so bright that like the Gibeonites, they will come and bow, all of them. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. When I was getting... This message ready, I was saying to myself, Stabi, Stabi, are you sure you're, you should be teaching this message? Are you sure you're teaching it to the right people? Don't you think that this is for a certain kind of person in a certain kind of place? Then, then I realized that everybody that got there started from somewhere. Okay? So if you sit here and you go, you check out on me because you're like, they're talking about government again. your life. If you read 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 13 and 14, it says, these things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, this is Paul writing to Timothy, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. <laughs> Paul said, Timothy, I'm writing to you because Timothy was a leader in church. He said, I would have preferred to share these things to you in, with you in person, but I'm writing in case I'm delayed. He said, this truth, if you apply them, what's going to happen is that you will grow up to become a pillar and a ground for truth. Here's the point. The uniquely ordained position of the church is so that society will always know where to go and what to do. That's the uniquely position, ordained position of the church. Because if they are in doubt, if society is in doubt, like I said, they just need to phone the bishop. They just need to phone the geo. If they can't find him, they can phone Temilade and the wisdom of God will show forth. And it will change the dynamics. In the days of Israel, the kings who served well and succeeded were largely the kings who were either aligned with God directly or took counsel from the prophet designate of their day. If you see that a king did well, the Bible will say that he did or he followed God or he did the commandments or he obeyed the commandments of God. So they will say that he's a good king. And where the king is not following the commandments, if the nation is still standing, there is a prophet who is the intercessor general on whose face, who is on his face constantly so that destruction will not come upon the land. 
If the leader is evil and there is no prophet, you will now understand what the Bible means, my brother, when he says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. I know we, we just use it for church. But every time there is no church, because the church is the shepherd, shepherding a body of society. Once church is not getting it, they've been struck. Everybody will walk on their head and they will think they are doing the right thing. Now, if you are part of the church, this ought to worry you. Because I don't want anybody to put this heavy thing on me. But it's been put on us already. And we ought to be very careful how we do. The point is that the church can only excel in this role if church herself is administered by the standard of the word of God. Abi, are we going to be prophet, do what I say and not what I do? We've tried it now. We've been doing that for the last three decades. Is it working? Where the man of God is sacred or the woman of God is sacred. We do what we want. And yet on Sunday, we come and back at everybody else. Is he walking? Can you not see through our pretense? You can now. You can. Even if you don't tell us, you don't take us seriously. We ought to know that you are not taking us seriously. <laughs> In 2 Kings chapter 3, we see this play out. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter number 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. <laughs> Father Lord, help, 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 help me. Help me today, oh, help me. 2 Kings chapter 3, starting from verse number 1. Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned 12 years. He did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not like his father and mother. For he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Now, Misha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he regularly paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened when Ahab died that the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. Then he went and sent to King Jehoshaphat of Judah saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to fight against Moab? <laughs> and he said, I will go up. I am as you. As I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses as your horses. Then he said, Which way shall we go up? And he answered, By way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And they marched on roundabout route, uh, on that roundabout route seven days. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Number one, did God send them? They did not ask him. Is, is that not the way we do? Oh God, answer us by fire. Jump where? Today, today. Not uh, Jesus. Not. You are lying. <laughs> Jehovah Shab Shab. You are lying. Nigeria, Pim. <laughs> if we've been praying these prayers for 40 years and nothing has changed, should we not sit down and count our teeth with our tongue and ask, as we pray, I reach if they know the answer, what will happen? <laughs> Aish, I know you don't like me right now. <laughs> Hey, the nation of Israel was in trouble. Jehoshaphat was the king of Judah. The king of Judah, but let me even read first. But Jehoshaphat said, 
This is verse 11. Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. Who poured water on the hands of Elijah? And Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Verse 13, then Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your fathers and the prophets of your mother. We church feed do this shakara. Before they call us, we don't jump. We don't reach there. We, in fact, we will fall that Ghana must go and carry it with us. Because it's opportunity that Ghana must go is going to, something is going to happen when we are leaving. And when we come, you know, when we come back, we say, praise the Lord. And the governor called me. But the governor is still not doing what he's supposed to do. And you came back from there two weeks ago. It's an indictment on the church. Elisha said to the king of Israel, said, what have I to do with you? You, evil man, go to the evil prophets of your father and your mother. Go and ask them what to do. You are in trouble. You now know how to come to me. But the king of Israel said to him, no. For the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. Surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I will not look at you nor see you. Elijah said, you think, and that prophet, that when I finish prophet, prophet lying, you will give money and I will go home. But the only reason I'm answering today is because of this man. Because I know this man follows God. The church ought to be able to say to the governor. The governor ought to say, I want to come and see you tomorrow. The church ought to be able to say, we, are, we know their house tomorrow. We, get, we they do prayer and fast. They come next week. The governor is not supposed to sit in, the, in their, or in their, or in their lounges, or lounges or whatever they call them, or lodges, and say, go and, call the, go and bring the prophet for me. But as church, no, no waiting that they do call. We don't know what they do now. Eh, Abby? <laughs> Aye. Because read that scripture very well. It said the king of Moab. Sorry, the king of Israel. The king of Judah. And the king of Edom. They went to meet Elisha. They did not say, go and call Elisha for us. They left their soldiers that did not have water. They went to meet Elisha. Elisha came out with a tie from his bedroom. Said, Talo Ambed, who is that person there? This early money. Said, now the kings or three of them. What can I do for you? Say, king, we they go war. Water no day. Animals no drink. Human beings, no, no body. There's no water. Be like, say, God won't kill us. They are going to make God kill you now. This ought to make us angry. If church did her job well, by staying within the parameters of God's word as her standard, we will notice that society shifts. So Elisha said to them, bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon, him, upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind nor shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water so that you, your cattle, brethren, you know how we use this scripture, right? We use it as prophecy for us. It was prophecy for the nation. This is, there was nothing wrong with the church. The church did not need ditches to fill supernaturally. 
It was the nation that had a drought issue. And that word was for the nation. But it was given by a prophet to Damo. A prophet that knew what he was doing with God. All we need to do. No, let me not run ahead of myself. The influence of the church in the last 100 years is in a steady decline. Why? Because we don't even administer our own affairs by the standard of God's word. How can society trust us? Two deacons want to become assistant pastor. One will write petition. How do people write anonymous petition inside church? Inside church, we are the holders of truth. They are writing petition against you. I don't put my name. If I cannot tell you, we come here every week. If I not, cannot show you truth, if I cannot speak truth to you, who born me to go tell local government counselor truth? Until we do this at home, we cannot export it. Until we can export it, society will continue to do this thing. So the next time you say Nigeria is corrupt, sit down and mourn for the church first before you say anything further. If the church were effective, every profitable business will have a spiritual advisor on their board. Like I told us when I taught us church government, this influence of the church is not just because she has divine intelligence. It is also because the church, through the word of God, has a care system for all things. The church, by the word of God, has a care system for all. It's only in the, how many constitutions of the word do you see that they say take care of widows? It is in the Bible that it says take care of the fatherless, take care of the orphans, take care of the widows. The church has a care system for every cadre of persons that walk through its doors. She has relation, a relational system that guides everyone. If you go to the book of Exodus and, yes, Exodus and Deuteronomy, so, uh, so, uh, part of Deuteronomy, you will see the system for relational, the relational system that God put together for the church. How we should take care of each other. How the servant should bow to the master. How the master should treat the servant. There was no way it was said that everybody would be a master. Get it right. He says, even though, even though someone is a servant, they will not even recognize their servant. He said, even when someone sells themselves by themselves into slavery, they will be so well taken care of that they do not matter. The church has a system for inheritances. He says, even when someone brings their land and gives it up because the person needs money, he says, the family that gets the land can only hold it to the next jubilee. He says that Jubilee, return, whether they paid you back or not, return the land to them because everybody in Israel must have land. The church has a system by the word of God for everything. The church has a system for raising children. He talks about the rod many times. The church has a system for marriages. He talks about husband loving the wife as Christ loved the church enough to lay down its life. He talks about the wife submitting. The church has a system for everything by the word of God. But let me not go into what we are doing. It's shameful what we are doing. The church has a resource control system that includes everyone. She has a judiciary system that cannot be subverted and no one is above. 
It is a church that first put, it is the word of God that first put it together. They call them cities of refuge in Joshua. So even if someone was suspected of murder, he can run to a city of refuge till there's such a time when he's tried properly and found guilty. It's not your constitution in your country that first said that you, it is, it is, everyone is presumed innocent until found guilty. It was first put in the Bible. Nations are taking parts of the Bible that would help them and they are living the most that call them into responsibility. And what the church is supposed to do is take those points and leave it so well that they become attractive. It's not for us to be shouting at them and say, you are sinful, you are sinful. It is to take God's resource control system. What's God's resource control system? Give and it shall be given unto you. Full measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. There is he that scattereth and tendeth to much. And there is he that scattereth and tendeth to nothing. The borrower will always be servant to the lender. It's Bible. If we have this lofty, beautiful, powerful things, why are we not utilizing them so that our results, we have men knocking on our doors, asking, why, why, what are you doing that is making this happen? Then you say, oh, come, let me open to Exodus chapter 20. I'll begin to read to you from verse number 12. I am the Lord my thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt that shall have an uh uh be like what are you talking about? Say that is the that is the secret. First bow before the God of heaven, and then I can show you the templates. We are not better until we can prove that we are better. The most profound lessons about anything are in God's word. And that means they are within the Bible. The church by her constitution, the Bible, has a model for all things that pertain to life and godliness. All we need to do is open the book, learn the lessons and the standards, Distill them into templates and strategies. Apply them and then make them exportable into society. If we do that, eh, there will be many, many churches on the Obalende Bridge, on the Oshodi Bridge. And these churches will be just be different, single individuals, gathering 10 people, 5 people, 2 people, and making a difference in those ones' lives. Not by handouts, but first of all, by grounding them by the word of God. And before we know it, there will be a movement in society that is so solid that it is not threatening of anybody. When, when, it's, when, the, when we stand, it's not all we are coming to protest. It is that we have something you need. You better knock on our doors to get it. For those of us who don't understand this, when we, we, we must do the word enough to be trusted by society so that they acknowledge our place in the sustainability of our societies. Do you get it? We must do the word enough that they can see so that they can trust us and our systems that we hold the keys to a sustainable society. For those of us who don't understand what Pastor Kojo Yemade does with a platform, this is what he does. It's easier to start a crusade and then talk at people and tell them how they're about to go to hell. But to be able to bring captains of industry, pay attention to me, people who are believers and are standing, and bring them into those conversations and let them begin to espouse and say, my takeoff point tomorrow is God. What he's trying to do is paint the picture that I'm trying to paint today. To say, see, there is a way it can be done without bribery, without corruption, without fraud, without spilling blood. Men have done it by the word of God. You can do it too. Now, 
If you think about it, you say, ah, it's Pastor Koji is already doing it. So what, uh, what are we talking about? We already have someone doing it. That's the problem. It's one platform too few. Wow. Think about it. Only one. It's too few. When the church understands what the church understands, this is inclusive of us. We will stop holding church conferences. We will begin to hold conferences for the word. Not so that they will come and fill our pews, but so that we can ground them and they will go and be effective. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm almost done. I decided not to do both of them because I wanted to take my time. Second Timothy chapter 3 in verse 16 and 17. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Does, did anybody see something? By the word of God, the word that is inspired by God, that's the Bible, all scripture, but that has been written <coughs> or given by the inspiration of God. Man begins to, when man learns it, it, man becomes profitable when it comes to doctrine. Now, when you hear doctrine, you're thinking about, what do you think about? You're thinking about consecration. You're thinking, of, doctrine is the mind of God. Profitable for doctrine. Profitable for reproof. What is that? To rebuke people. To criticize people. So that when you want to criticize me, bring me a scripture that points to what I am doing is wrong. Because I am a man under the authority of God's word. If you show it to me from the scripture, that's my constitution. I will thank you. I will not quarrel. I will begin to make my adjustments. <laughs> is someone listening? It says it is profitable for correction. For instruction in righteousness. That what will happen. That the man of God may be complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now I hope you saw that it said good work. It didn't say church work. It said good work. That means be, to become a good president is good work. To become a good omalanke pusher is good work. To become a good house help is good work. To become a good driver is good work. So that the man is complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. There is no good work that can be done unless a man is being equipped by the scripture. I know if you're not a believer, you think to me, that's, that's really narrow-minded. Here's my challenge. Show me one constitution in the word that does not take its root from the Bible. One. There's none. Thou shall not kill is from the Bible first. Thou shall not covet your neighbor's wife is from the Bible first. Every part of scripture, this is how the message says it. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful. For one way, useful one way or another. Showing us truth. Exposing our rebellion. Correcting our mistakes. Training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. Here's the conclusion of the whole matter. I told us when we started that the church exists for three things. For the exaltation of God, for the edification of the saints, and for the evangelization of the word. One of the things that I learned when I went to Maui in 2018 is that evangelism is no longer by crusades. 
Because in case you don't know, the people that came for four squared crusade are the ones that will come for redeemed crusade if it's in their neighborhood. They are the ones that will go for elevation crusade. Then they will cross over to power must change hand crusade. Then they will go from there to deeper life crusade. From there they will stop at REM. This is one weekend. They've done seven. From there they will go to uh, from one crusade to another crusade is the same people. If we could take photos of them and begin to track them, it's the same people. Evangelism is moved from crusades. Please, I'm not saying don't do crusades anymore. Evangelism is moved to marketplaces. Evangelism is moved into offices. Evangelism is moved into, into hospitals. Evangelism is moved to places, local government offices, state offices. That's where the real evangelism is happening now. Where you show up in all of the fullness of God's light in you. And that light is so attractive that men want to do what you do. Many years ago, I worked with a parastata, a government parastata. I did not last more than one year. There was no way I was going to last more than one year. Because even the very first day I walked into that premises, I could, I could feel corruption. That it was so thick that I could cut it with a knife. And I was saying, God, how? What am I doing here? This is really bad. So I lasted one year. But in that one year, the first month after I came, they were sharing provision. They called them store items. So every month they would share omo, conflicts, milk, sugar, um, locks, dental soap, toilet rolls. Sometimes they will share fans, they will share wheelbarrow. Depending on how high you are, they will share generators. And this was happening every month. So the first month, butter, everything they shared. So me, I was very happy. I said, yeah, this organization, they, they give provision. <laughs> That's why I call it provision go house. That night I sleep, now God wake me up. I say, only wake up. <laughs> I said, huh? Which one be only? God, I promise you, I know the thief again. Since I come home, my blessing house, I know the thief again. Say, <laughs> so you are a thief. I said, me, I'm not a thief. What is a thief? He said, that make way good. They get, now you get her. I said, they gave me that sugar. Now you get the toilet roll. You don't even use and self. Now, are you the owner? I said, they gave me. I, not just me, they give everybody. According to your level, they will give you your own. He said, when you collected it, did you ask me where it came from? So said, no, be you give me now. I asked the people where they bring it. They said, no, store items. He said, did you ask them where store items come from? I said, no. So said, you should have asked. <sighs> okay, God, where store items come from? It turns out that store items were items that were contract every, you know, th that organization th thrived on awarding contracts. So when every month they were award contracts to their vendors and to millions and maybe billions of naira, I don't know, because they were a major mo money spending parastata. Now, they, when they want to, imagine, they were award contract of Webarrow in January. They, somebody would uh, deliver 500 wheelbarrows. In May, they will award contract for 500 wheelbarrow again. Wait, did they eat wheelbarrow? How do wheelbarrows spoil in five months that we now need more wheelbarrows? But the proof is that there's no wheelbarrow in the store. So when they Say they award the contract for Webarrow again. The reason they are awarding those contracts is because they are getting kickbacks from the contracts. So when they were awarding May, and somebody may question, although nobody used to question, but just to cover their tracks, in April, if they know they were award contract for Webarrow in May, in April they would dash us Webarrow. Because they must exhaust it. And then in May they were award fresh contract for Webarrow. So those tissues, the soap, the milk, 
the sugar, the middle of carry go house. Not stolen item. God said to me, could share a mole. One month you don't join them. Ha. I say, hey. I went back to the one where I never use I carry up. Must well say where they go inside like they return them. Of course, there's nobody to return it to. So I just dashed somebody. I did wait for next month. Next month again, store items don't come. Mrs. Modi, I, I use God, Jesus, to beg you people. I don't want store items. I did not preach, oh. I did not say these store items, not tifo. Because now me, God tell. All I said was me, I no take store items again. Somebody said, you no take store items. I said, no. I said, why? She was my friend. I said, Nike, they say not tea for you. She was a worker in the redeem. I was a worker in the redeem. Say, how it be thief? Not be all God them give us. Say, where? Now, wait till God tell me that he's not a thief. <laughs> so, me, I no go fit take again. So, I work for you. But I didn't take again. Fast forward a few months down the line. They started to give me petty cash, a voucher, a petty cash, whatever, disbursements to retire. So, the first month, they told me to uh, make requisition. They gave me a list. I made requisition for petty cash. Then when the money was ready, accounts were called. You go up and collect the money and come and give it to the ogre. So I went and collected cash and gave it to the ogre. Month has ended. The people have put in application for fresh uh, petty cash. So they said, Mrs. Modi, go and apply for new petty cash. I said, okay. How? I said, say, okay, you have to retire the last one. I said, that's easy. Oga, give me the receipt of how you spent the last petty cash. Say, Mrs. Modi, we don't do it like that. Go and ask Nike how we do it. Okay. Nike, how do we do petty cash retirement? Nike said, ah, just go to the file. Dig, 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 dig under. Just take one and just copy it and change the date. I said, what did you say? He said, go to the file. Dig, dig, dig under. Take one, copy it, change the date. I said, you mean there are no receipts for this one that I collected last month? She said, no, there's no receipt. This is how we do it. I said, no, I'm not retiring this petty car show. I went back. I said, oh, God. I said, Nika said I should dig, dig, dig. I said, hey, that's how they do it. I said, oh, God, no go fit. I said, why would you not fit? I said, oh, God, I will sign. He said, and so, and so. I said, it's fraud. Oga me, I will not fit to do it. He looked at me. He looked at me. He said, okay, give it to Nike to do. I did not quarrel. Carried it in. I did not say, Oga, you should do it right. Because Oga said, na redeem worker. <laughs> so I carried file. And I said, Nike, Oga said, make I give you. Nika said, what's your phone? I said, I told you I'm not going to do it. So I told her, I won't do it. She said, he said to give it to you. Nika said, give me the file. She told she walked. I said, oh, God, myself won't go help. I'll not do it again. <laughs> there was no quarrel. What did I say? They will see. And then they will imitate. She couldn't imitate the return of store items. Perhaps not immediately because not only one year I last for there. Don't forget, they sacked me. <laughs> I did not do anything, but they sacked me. <laughs> but one day, she too said, she not go do store, um, retire petty cash again. She went back and said, Oga, myself, I want to go to heaven. I'm not retiring petty cash again. Oga said, give it to me. Oga started to retire petty cash until they sacked me. Hallelujah. I actually resigned. But then they now, six months later, they sent me a letter of dismissal. Nami resigned and then dismissed me. But it's okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you choose to do the work as the church, they will throw us in jail sometimes. We will lose jobs sometimes. They will not promote us sometimes. And that's the reason why we are not doing the work. 
but we want society to be better. Here's good news for you and for me. You may think you have scaled it, but you have children. You may think your children will not live in Nigeria, but you have grandchildren. You may think your grandchildren will not live in Nigeria, but you have nieces and nephews. Everybody shall cannot empty out of Nigeria. So whether we like it or not, righteousness, we need to go back and do it. A church under God. We cannot do the evangelization of the word by boom boom anymore. They don't need it. They know scripture more than you. They want to see your light. It's the only thing that the Bible says darkness cannot comprehend. Darkness can comprehend and can preach more than me. Darkness can comprehend and can sing more than you. Darkness have more money more than you. Darkness can design things more than you. But light, darkness cannot comprehend it. Unless I light my candle and I put it on top of the bushel so that all may see A church under God. Stabi, when are you going to finish this thing so that we'll go back to the things that concern me, myself, and I when you become the light? Because the truth is, my brother, if we become the light, me, myself, and I will not be needful. Like Paul, you begin to realize that if I leave, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Those things will not bother us anymore. You get money, you don't matter. You don't get money. You don't get money, my God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I have learned to abase and to abound. That's where we need to go. In conclusion, here's the, here's the sad part part that I need you to see. You see, God left us on earth to further, to establish the kingdom. Remember our scripture, Matthew 6 verse 10, that your will be done on earth, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is how we do it. By ensuring that the word of God is how we grow up so that others will want what we have. I know I didn't preach anything today, but you can stand because I'm done. And you can join me to thank God that you are a church under God. <laughs> if you dare to tell God this morning, I'm a church under God. If you dare this evening, dare it, say I'm a church because each individual is a church, you know, because the Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So, Timila, they dare to say it, I'm a church under God. Pastor Omi dare to say it, I'm a church under God. Each one of us must be a church under God. Unless all of us are churches under God, the world cannot be a church under God. And this is the light that others will see. That you and me will do the right thing according to the standard of God's word. Whether it gives us something or it doesn't give us anything. So that at the end of the day, God will be glorified. Father Lord, make me a church under God. Help me, O oh God, to become a church under God. In all things and in all ways, make me a church under God. Father Lord, I thank you. Father Lord, I give you praise. I glorify you. Yes, Lord. I am a church under God. As we begin to, as I want to close, I want to ask if there's anyone here who's yet to give their lives to Jesus. It is the first step towards becoming a church under God. Please give your life to Jesus. Say with me, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. And for the rest of us, let us break our bread. And take communion and ask for grace to become a church under God. As we break our bread in the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, 
the name of God, the Holy Spirit. And as we eat, and as we drink, that God will find us worthy vessels whose light is making a difference. Lord, help us. Let your name be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Hallelujah.